All right, last time uh, we were here, we, were, we finished up section 7.1, which is the area between two curves. Now, just to let you guys know, in case you didn't know, you have uh, a homework set due today, and uh, we're going to take it up. You've got until 2 p.m. to actually turn it in because I'm going to do a special review session this afternoon in Fretwell 113 where I'm actually going to go over this thing. So um, it's a good representative of what you can anticipate on your test. Okay, Your test is going to cover chapter 6.1 through 6.6. The last hoorah of integration and everything you're supposed to know about integration. Basic rules, use substitution, integration by parts, even including chapter five, but then partial fractions, tables, uh, uh, numerical methods, and improper integrals is also going to be kind of heavily emphasized on that particular test, but you got to know everything. Because we're moving on to chapter seven, and last time, and if you, you check over here, I actually uh, brought up the little syllabus, and we're just ahead of the syllabus just ever so slightly. Last time I actually finished up uh, section 7.1 because we didn't have that much to do in 6.6 .6 to finish that up. And 7.1 is kind of a short section because it's about area between two curves. Top minus bottom dx, right minus left dy. But you have to kind of set up your system there. So, we're, so but we're moving on because this is calculus. So uh, um, here's the deal. I'm going to be moving on to chapter... Um, 7.2 today, even though it says it's supposed to start next Wednesday, I'm going to go ahead and start 7.2 today to get you a feel for it. I know you haven't done the pre-section video on that thing and we're taking the quiz. That's okay. I can still kind of explain what stuff's going on here and stuff. So, um, But uh, here's the deal. Since your test, your homework set is due today, just want to remind you, when is your test number two going to be? Monday, just to let you guys know in case you forgot. All right. So, like I said, last time we talked about area between two curves. Top minus bottom dx, right minus left dy. And so, we're moving on to do volume rotation. Now, uh, again, please go and watch the pre-section video that I made for you guys that kind of discusses this concept, and I did these problems for you guys. So, I did quite a few of them. I did six problems for you guys to kind of discuss the idea of what's going on here and to set you up. There's basically, there's two methods. Now, the one thing, other thing I want to focus on before we get started is this. If you look at your notes, you'll notice that I put 7.2 slash 7.3. 7.2 is called the disc slash washer method of volume rotation. 7.3 is called a washer method of shell method or, excuse me, shell method cylindrical shells of volume rotation. 7.1, 7.2 is disc washer, 7.3 is shell method, cylindrical shell method. But it's all dealing with the same concept of volume rotation. So we decided to go ahead and make one big, big set of notes. If you look at section 7.2 slash 7.3, you notice it's rather thick because it's actually two sections in one. On web work, we did break them up. There's a 7.2 section and there's a 7.3 section. But in terms of the notes, we put the two concepts together in terms of how we're going to explain it. Now, so if you turn over here, the other major ideas that you're going to need to know for this particular section is sometimes in terms of formulas. The volume of a, uh, a cylinder, and the cylinder is a disc, except the height is very, very small. And you should know, you're going to see this formula a lot, that the volume of a, uh, a cylinder, a disc, is pi r squared h. The volume of a uh, cylinder uh, disc, when you, uh, basically you've got an inner one and an outer one. This is called a washer, if you will because it looks like a washer, okay, it's going to be pi r squared h minus pi r squared h, where you have a big R and a little r. Big R is the big radius from the inside to the outer edge, and the little radius is from the inside to the part that's being removed, the little, little radius there, and that's where you subtract the little r because that part's being removed. 
So you, we're going to come up with a formula that you're going to see, pi big R squared minus little r squared times H. The other concepts you're going to need to know in this particular section is, number one, um, distance between functions. So when I talk about a distance between functions, there's two different ways of looking at it. And you've seen this because it's back from Chapter 7.1. It's this idea of top function minus bottom function. That's going to be the distance between these two functions. That'll be in terms of x. Top minus bottom gives you a distance. Or, if you're not doing top and bottom, you're going to do right and left. It's going to be right minus left, and that's going to be your dy. This right minus left and top minus bottom is going to be a distance between two functions, whether the location of those two functions. Because we're going to be tying all this stuff together to create volume. And you'll, you'll see in a second here. So, just an example of this concept here. Determine the distance between... Uh, y equals negative x squared plus 4, and y equals x plus 1. Now, I'm not talking about finding the uh, area between the two curves. We want it from a distance. So the distance is equal to, well, these functions are in terms of x. The top function is the upside-down parabola, so that would be the top function of the negative x squared plus 4, minus the bottom function, the function that defines the bottom is the line, uh, x plus 1. And notice the wonderful use of parentheses here. So this idea of top minus bottom actually calculates the distance at arbitrary values of x between these two functions. But if you look at the next problem here, we want to determine the distance between the two functions, well, two uh, relations here, x equals y squared plus 2 and x equals 1 half y minus 2. Well, the x equals y squared, that's probably on the side, plus 2 has been shifted to the right two units. This is x equals y squared plus 2. And the line, because they're both powers 1 here, is x equals 1 half y minus 2. This is a right-left because the functions are in terms of y. So the distance between these two functions is going to be equal to the function on the right, which is the y squared plus 2, minus the function on the left, and the function on the left is line, parentheses, one-half y minus two. Now, of course, you can go and clean them up later, but this is right minus left. So at any arbitrary point that I pick, I can get the exact distance between these two functions, okay? And this, again, is going to be very helpful terminology for you guys when we start talking about volume rotation. The other things you're going to need to know in this particular section in terms of the algebra review is a little bit of trigonometry. Now, we're setting you up for some bizarre Welberg problems that you're going to have to endure later on. And one of those is an equilateral triangle. Well, let's talk about that for a second. What's an equilateral triangle? Triangle where all the sides are the same, and if all the sides are the same, that also means all the angles are the same. So... We have here, you know, an equilateral triangle, so all the sides are the same and all the angles are 60 degrees. But if we're interested, and what we're going to be is interested in is area. So because, let me explain. We're going to be going after volume. What exactly is volume? Well, if it's a box, it's length times width times height. It's three-dimensional. But if your base surface is a triangle and then you lift it out of that and you have something like a prism or something like that, it's basically, it's the area of the bottom times the height of the three-dimensional object. And that third dimension makes it going to be units cubed. Just like we would, when we did area, I always made you guys do units squared. Well, now we're going to be doing volume. It's going to be units cubed. But you've got to be able to get the area of the base before you can actually put the height on it. So being this is an equilateral triangle, we would split this thing down the middle, and it turns it into the famous 30, 60, 90 triangle. We know the area of a triangle is going to be one-half base times height, Splitting it down the middle makes this hot, this the, the long side here going to the perpendicular side equal to the height. And because you should know stuff about the 30, 60, 90 triangle, the side opposite the 30 degree angle is always half the hypotenuse. And by the Pythagorean theorem, that's going to make the other side the square root of 3 divided by 2 times the height of the hypotenuse, which is S. And then you can do 1 half base times height. And you're going to come up with a very interesting formula for a an equilateral triangle. That is, the area is equal to the square root of 3 divided by 4 times the side squared, and the side is any side that you want to pick there. 
The other famous triangle that you're going to encounter is the famous 45-45-90, the isosceles right triangle. An isosceles right triangle, so it's a right angle, and you've got 45 in one angle, 45 in the other, and this is 90, so thumb, uh, 180 degrees. And the relationship on the famous 45-45-90 is if you look at the legs of these guys being an isosceles triangle, these are the same. That would force the hypotenuse to be the square root of 2 times that side. It comes from the Pythagorean theorem. And so when you do um, the area, it's going to be one-half the base times height, but the base is S and the height is S, so that's going to be one-half S squared. Other things that you're going to need to know in this section for some very special web work problems, that you know we're setting you guys up for a bunch of stuff, is the standard formula of an ellipse. Now, this is something called conic sections that you should have discussed in uh, Algebra 2 high school or Algebra, I don't know what they call it now, Math 3 or something or other. But uh, this is the famous, and all we care about is one centered at the origin. We'll get into more of the elaborate types of these when I get you guys into Calculus 3. We're going to go back and take pay attention to three-dimensional uh, ellipse, ellipses called ellipsoids and things like that, like footballs and stuff. But uh, this one is a two-dimensional one where you have x over a squared plus y over b squared is equal to 1. That's in the standard form of equation of an ellipse where you center this thing at the origin, and because A is underneath the X, you go in the uh, X direction, A and negative A, and that's called the major vertices. B is underneath the Y, so you go up B and down negative B, and you plot your point and then connect your dots. So what an ellipse is, is it's a circle that's been smushed. You know, X squared plus Y squared plus R squared, but when the, uh, when the, uh, the ratio of the X and the Y are not going to be the same, you're going to push it in on one side and push it out on the other, and it makes the ellipse. And you have ellipse looking like this, or you have one looking like this, and this would tell me that the B is bigger than the A. So you can smoosh it one way versus the other. But this is the classic formula for an equation of an ellipse. And again, when I get you guys into Calculus 3, um, you'll see this type of stuff again. under the We'll go back and review conic sections of parabolas, ellipses, hyperbolas, and then we're going to make them 3D, and we're talking about we put the word oid on everything, makes it awesome. Ellipsoids, hyperboloids, and these are three-dimensional shapes and stuff like that. So you haven't seen the rest of this, but for this section, we're going to be talking about the two-dimensional classic ellipses. Okay? But web work problem. Don't worry, I got it saved for you guys when I get to my notes. A couple other things in terms of web work. They define some stuff for you guys, and that is um, over here they defined... Uh, the concept of a frustrum. When I tell, hey, you got a frustrum here, nobody knows what I'm talking about when I say a frustrum. Then I go, oh, you know, you've ever been to the circus and see what the elephant stands on? Oh, yeah. Okay. It's a cone where the, uh, the way we do it, the top, the bottom part has been cut out. So it's just a top part that's been cut. So it's kind of, it's a circle on top, circle on the bottom, and you got your slant. So the cross section is actually a trapezoid, if you look at it. So this is called a frustrum. We're going to find some volumes of frustrums in this class, so that's that in this particular section. And the other one is the cap of a sphere. So you happen to have a sphere, and you make a horizontal cut, and that height of that little cap, we're going to be finding the volume of those type of things. Okay? And to set you guys up, what's really going on in this particular section is volume rotation. We're going to be taking particular areas and rotating them around either an x-axis or a y-axis or some type of axis that I described to you guys. So when you take a surface like a, and this guy happens to be a trapezoid, and you rotate it around the y-axis, it's going to create your frustrum. Okay? And if over here we take an equation of a circle and we rotate it around, in this case once again the y-axis, if you take the entire circle and rotate it, you create a sphere. If you just take the top part, you create the cap or the, uh, of a sphere and stuff. So this idea of volume rotation stuff, that's where we're going with this stuff. So for, to make you guys understand exactly where we're going with this, this is where my engineering students really get excited because they begin to see the application of this integral calculus that we're teaching you guys. So a lot of folks have been asking me about my pens and stuff like that. My uncle makes these pens, and they're for sale if you want to buy one. Uh, but he's, he's retired, and he has a wood lathe at home. So I brought another pen, my, my wooden one here. 
today. So this one is my NASCAR pin because it's got a nice little uh, uh, gear shift there with the uh, first through six gears on it and stuff. It's really cool. And this one actually is made out of uh, olive wood from the Holy Land, so it's really cool. So um, I'm going to focus on this one because this is uh, wood. So what my uncle does is he puts this thing on a wood lathe. And it's, originally, it's a block of wood, and it spins. Okay? Well, he doesn't put the pin. You put the pin kit together. So he puts this part on a wood. And it's a block of wood. And he takes his chisel, and he shaves out a particular equation out of this thing. So this thing's not straight. It's actually bowed out. So, and then he, he, he cuts it out, and then he sands it down. And while it's spinning, it makes it very smooth. And, but if you look at the cross section of this thing, it's a straight line. And there's your axis right there. So there's a little bit area. But as you rotate it, it's going to create volume. This is what you're finding in this particular section. We're going to do volume rotation. We're going to take a particular region and rotate around an axis to create volume. So I'll try to describe that to you guys in these notes in terms of drawing this thing up. So here it is. <clears throat> On this one, it says, consider uh, the graph of a random continuous function. Here's f of x. And I just drew it in here. Here's my x-axis. Here's my y-axis. And we're going to rotate this. And if you look at it, we're going to rotate it. We're going to put particular points here. I'm going to talk about this being A and this being B. And we're going to look at this particular region right here between the x-axis and the function. So all I'm doing is giving you a function, but where I am identifying it right back to the x-axis. So this is an area. You with me? And what we're going to do is we're going to rotate it around the x-axis. When I rotate this region around the x-axis, you're going to have, the, here's my classic function again, but when you rotate it, you've got to envision, I'm going to say here's B and here's A, you've got to envision this aspect of being circular. So you've got this rotation. So this thing's being rotated, and it's like this pin, it's going to fill up. This thing will be solid. Does that make sense? Your axis is where the, uh, the, the, the pins were holding it in, as this thing was rotating and stuff. So it rotates this guy, and it's going to create a three-dimensional uh, volume. So that's what I'm trying to draw down here. And what we're going to do is we're going to find this guy. We're going to find the volume of this thing. Let me set you up with the formula. So now you have to envision the engineering. So I've got this based upon one equation between A and B over here. i got one equation with bounds. Now. You envision this three-dimensional object. Now, this concept that I'm teaching you guys is a very important concept of understanding how interval calculus works and how you set up an interval for stuff. So if I'm going to go over here and almost somewhere in, in the middle of my little region here, I'm going to make a little cut. So I'm going to draw my little Ginsu knife over here, and we're going to cut a little slither out of this volume that I'm creating. Now, if I make a little slither out of this thing, what's this little piece going to look like? When I slide this little piece out, it's going to look like this. Does that make sense? It makes a little disc. It is delta x tall or wide, however you know how you look at it. And the other thing is, this was my centering point, and being circular, I need to know the radius. What is my radius equal to? Well, the radius is actually based upon where I put my little cut at, and it's based upon the actual function itself. Does that make sense? This would be the radius from this point to this point, but that point is defined by the function. So what would the volume of this guy be? And I'm going to call this delta volume. Delta standing for change. The change in volume, but because this is a disk or a cylinder, you can look at it like this, and you can see it's a cylinder. It's a cylinder. We have the formula, as we mentioned before, pi r squared h. But putting the terms that I have in there, this means that your delta volume would be equal to pi. Your radius is based upon the function, but it's going to be squared. But the height of this disk is delta x. Does that make sense? Now, that's just one little slice. What I'm talking about here to create volume is I'm going to do lots of little slices. I'm going to make a slice here, a slice here, a slice here, a slice here, 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 here. And when I make these little slices, you're going to see these little slices all over the place.
So we slice this thing up. So now it looks like a bunch of poker chips, right? And we stack the poker chips together. So to get the volume of your whatever you're making, in this case, it's going to look like a vase. But remember, this one's going to be solid. It's going to, it's going to be the sum of every little, delta, every little delta volume that you made the slice out of. So you create the formula, volume is equal to the sum of the delta volume, which is pi times f of x squared times delta x. Now, so in this summing up, we're talking about making a slice here, slice here, slice here, slice here, and we're summing up all these little, little miniature little volumes to create total volume. But now, here's the important part. We're going to put this together from an integral calculus perspective. Applying calculus to this, what does summation turn into? Integral. This is pi, f of x squared, and your delta x will turn into dx. That's integral calculus. And then all you got to do is put your bounds on there, a to b. And it creates a formula. Volume is equal to, I'm pulling my constant out front, pi times integral from a to b of your function f of x squared dx. This is called the disk form method. Disk formula, if you will. Because this guy is a solid. So when I'm talking about, for example, my pin here, that we're rotating this little, this little barrel, and we cut out the little edge out of this thing, because it used to be a square block, and then polish it up, we're creating volume. But at this point, it is solid. Then we're going to have to put a hole through it so the pin field can go through it and stuff like that. We'll talk about putting the hole through it in just a second. This is the disk formula. So here's your first formula with this stuff. Does that make sense? I mean, we're applying, but this is the integral calculus. This is the most important thing because you'll see this concept a lot throughout Chapter 7, applying the integral and setting up. I'm writing it as a summation, a Riemann sum, and then applying integral calculus to it to create the integral formula. So what I just described for you guys, I did my best, is to uh, type it up so that everybody could actually pay attention to what I'm doing here because you know, all the other professors are also using these notes and stuff. But this is the main idea. Your, your volume of your disk, I call it the delta volume, is equal to pi times r squared times h, but your radius is your function, squared times delta x. So, and then when you make all these slices, you sum them up, and then applying summation turns into integral and delta x turns into dx, you create the disk method formula. Okay? So, I got a problem here. It says this. Sketch and find the volume that is created by rotating the area bounded by the curves y equals e to the x, y equals 0, x equals 0, and x equals 1 about the x-axis. And I tried to draw a little bit of this thing for you, but uh, I made it awfully light. So here's my function, y equals e to the x. Here is the x-axis. Here is my y-axis. And this is my function, y equals e to the x. Does that make sense? Now, we got some more. Y equals zero, the x-axis is y equals zero. So this is on top, this is on bottom. X equals zero, x equals zero is the uh, y-axis. And then I got one more point, x equals one. So here it is right here, if you look at your point, this is one, this would be the line, x equals one. So in terms of all these equations they gave me, there has been a region that has been captured by these equations. Where is that region at? It is located here. So if you think about it, before I talk about volume, I'm going to be looking at a cross-sectional area. Now we're going to rotate this guy. And so if you rotate it, you've got this reverse image, and that's what I kind of drew down here of your function being rotated around the x-axis. And this block is going to show up down here, and this is what you're going to be finding the volume of. Okay, not quite a frustrum, but it's going to look like one turned on its side because it does have a little uh, angle cut to going through there. But that's what we're going to try to find the volume of. But I'm telling you people right now, before you try to figure out what picture you're trying to make, use the region first. So let me redraw this guy. Here is y equals e to the x. Here is uh, y equals 0 x-axis. x equals 0 is the y-axis, and x equals 1. We're talking about this region. Because when you set up the integral, 
That region is what sets up the integral, not where you're going, but where it is originally. So to create this volume, volume is equal to pi times integral of my function squared dx from a to b. Applying my formula, this would be pi times integral from 0 to 1. Because this is solid and the bottom is the x-axis, it's top minus bottom, but e to the x minus 0, my function is, it makes my function e to the x, but it's going to be squared dx. So this is literally plugging the parts into my formula. But before you integrate it, never forget John's fundamental theorem of calculus. It says better to do your algebra before your calculus than afterwards. Clean it up first, then integrate it. What is this mess? e to the x squared. A power to a power, what do you do with the powers? Multiply. So this turns into volume is equal to pi times integral of e to the 2x dx from 0 to 1. Now, integrate. Thanks to chapter 5 and chapter 6, we can do this. A pi is a constant, leave it alone. What is the integral of e to the 2x dx? Well, that's that e to the kx dx thing you're supposed to have memorized. Integral e to the kx dx is 1 over k e to the kx. That becomes pi over 2 e to the 2x, evaluated from 0 to 1. And then the fundamental theorem of calculus, you plug in top minus plug in bottom. This would be pi over 2 times e to the 2 times 1 minus pi over 2 e to the 2 times 0. 2 times 0 is 0. e to the 0 is 1. So all that goes makes it 1. So my answer is pi over 2 e squared minus pi over 2. That is the exact volume. Very uh, transcendental with all these irrational numbers in it. But what's the last thing I'm going to put? Because we found the volume. Units cubed. And it's the volume of this region right here as it was rotated. So this is the picture. And so you're going to sit there. What do I call this type of stuff? When I can't rem actually look at it and know what, the, what it is, I mean, sometimes I can look at it and imagine something. But when, I, when, I don't, when I'm out of my words, I'll just call it a widget. And that's what they typically call it also in Dr. Stewart and his textbook. Uh, what's the volume of this widget? Okay, this uh, little, little cog or whatever. To me, this thing looks like more like a cork or something like that. You stick in a bottle or something like that. We just found the volume of it, the exact volume. Does that make sense? I lose you guys anywhere. Well, when they're solid, it is called the disk method. However, if they're not solid, so what we're going to have here is we've got this region where we have a top function, f of x, and we're going to have this bottom function, g of x. And we're talking about the distance between the two that we're going to rotate. And so when you when you got this, and so the g, f of x is up here, and then you're going to take away the stuff below g of x, and then you're going to rotate it. It turns it into a washer. We're math people, so don't think too deep in our names here. It looks like a washer because it's, it's hollow on the inside, and you've got the solid going around the outside. So to come up with this guy, the volume, I'll call this delta volume, the change in volume of this little slice, which looks like this, would be equal to, you've got to have the big cylinder, pi big R squared times your delta X, but then you've got to take away pi times the little radius, because the R, little R squared times delta X. This is the big circle taking away the inner circle. Does that make sense? Now, because there's a pi and a delta in common here, we're going to factor that out. It'll be pi times parentheses big R squared minus little r squared, and then factor out the delta x in the back. And that's where they're getting their little formula. But that also means when you look at this guy, the big radius is defined by the top function. All the stuff we're doing right now is in terms of x, dx. So this would be big F of x squared minus the little radius. So just draw it on here. Here is your big radius, which is defined by F of x. Here is your little radius, which is defined by G of x. So big F of x squared minus little G of x squared times delta x. 
And that's my change in volume, and that's what they've written down here. And then what are we going to do? That's one slice, and imagine making an infinite amount of slices over here. And again, like poker chips, and we're going to stack them up to create the volume. So I'm going to sum up that pi times. So to calculate that volume, you're going to sum up the little delta volumes, the slices that you made. And I'm going to sum up this pi times f of x squared minus g of x squared delta x. And then come down here applying integral calculus to this. Summation turns in integral, delta x turns into dx, and I end up having my next formula. So volume is equal to, pulling out the constant pi, times integral from a to b of your top function, f of x squared, minus the bottom function, g of x squared, dx. And this is called the washer method formula. So when you see me talk about these formulas, to me, these formulas look exactly alike, except when it's solid, I don't subtract off anything because there's nothing, in the, uh, nothing below it. But when it's, a when it's a washer, I'm taking big radius minus little radius, big f of, x, f of x squared minus g of x squared. But it's the same formula, so I shall call it the disk slash washer method, okay? So I'll let you know my terminology because, okay, they're two, con two different concepts, but it's the same concept. Whether you're removing stuff on the inside or making it solid is the only difference. And when you're removing it, you're going to get a washer out of it. When you don't remove anything out of the inside, it's going to be solid. That's called the disk method. So you've got really two formulas with this stuff. But now, in both of these formulas, I might function. Listen up, because this is important. The functions are in terms of x, and we're rotating them around the x-axis. Does that make sense? There's a pattern here. My functions are in x. I'm rotating around the x-axis, so I've got my wood lathe right here, and the thing is spinning, and I'm cutting it this way because my axis is on the x-axis. Because you know what we're going to have to go. We're going to have to turn the axis on our side like this and rotate stuff this way. Okay? But when I turn it on this side, that's the main axis is y, so you're going to see this dy aspect of this stuff. Okay? So here's a problem for that. says this, washer method, volume equals pi times integral from a to b of f of x squared minus g of x squared dx. And again, when rotating about the x-axis, functions in terms of x, rotating around the x, and honestly, I'm trying to use the same terminology that I used in chapter 7.1. How do you find the area between two curves? Top minus bottom. The only difference here is top squared minus bottom squared, and you're sticking a pi in front of the darn thing. So there's a pattern with the formulas. So sketch and find the volume that is created by rotating the curves. Here we go. We've got y equals 2x minus x squared, and we got y equals x squared about the x-axis. Okay? Again, this whole concept, now I keep talking about wood lathes, but it doesn't matter if you've got a wood lathe or a metal lathe, the idea of taking a block and rotating it and shaping it out is the exact same thing. And for those people that like pottery, you're doing the same thing with that type of stuff too in terms of how much uh, you know, material that you're using with that stuff. So here we go. First thing I'm going to do is I've got to get a picture of my region. So I'm going to go Y equals, clear out this old stuff I've been playing with, and here we go, 2x minus x squared and x squared. And I'm going to do a zoom standard, negative 10 by 10, negative 10 by 10 screen. And I see the y equals x squared, that's this parabola. y equals 2x minus x squared, that's an upside down parabola. Do you see a region that's captured between these two curves? Well, let me zoom in on it so maybe you can see it a little bit better. Zooming in right about there. It's a very small region. Here's the upside down parabola. Here's the regular parabola. We're talking about that region right there. Does that make sense? So, drawing that out, we have here, this is a classic parabola. Labeling it, y equals x squared. Here is my upside down parabola that comes over here and does this. This is the y equals 2x minus x squared parabola. We're talking about this region. Okay? 
I need my points of intersection. One point of intersection is very obvious, the origin. So that's at zero. What is this point right here? Now, you don't always have to set the two equations equal to each other to figure stuff out. Sometimes you can look at it and go, yeah, it's pretty obvious. What point when I plug in x squared is going to be the same point as plugging it into 2x minus x squared? 1. 1 squared is 1. 2 times 1 is 2. Minus 1 squared is 1. 2 minus 1 is 1. So when you plug in 1, you get the exact same point, which is 1. You can also see, see the little hash mark 1 there? It's right there where it meets at. So if you look at it, draw the calculator and tell. But if you really want to, second, calculate, find the point of intersection. You know, first curve, yes. Second curve, yes. I guess it's right about there. It's the point 1, 1. Here it is, x equals 1. Y is 1 also, in case you wanted to know. Uh, but if worse comes to worse, or if I put a gun to your head and say, find the point of intersection, what do you do? You set the two equations equal to each other, and you solve. Okay? But we're more advanced than that, so using technology to find the point of intersection, for the most part, unless I specify, I'm good with that. Okay? So, now, let's find this volume. We're going to rotate this guy about the x-axis. So I envision rotating it, but I'm not going to draw my region yet. I'm going to envision rotating this thing, but what I see here is I've got a top function and a bottom function on my region. So that means when I rotate, I'm going to have a hole in it. That requires the washer formula. Volume equals pi times integral from A to B of f of x top squared minus g of x bottom squared dx. So this would be equal to pi times integral of the top function the function that's on top is actually the upside down parabola, 2x minus x squared. But don't forget, you've got to square it minus the bottom function. The bottom function is x squared, and you've got to square it, dx. Top squared minus bottom squared. Does that make sense? And what are my bounds? It's the bounds for the region. That's why I want you to look at the region, because the setup is here. But when I start to try to show you what it looks like, it gets kind of confusing and you'll miss the picture. The picture's right here that sets up your integral from 0 to 1. Does that make sense? Did I lose you guys anywhere? Now, if I made you guys integrate this thing by hand, how would you do it? That's right. Fold it out and squared squared. If you did it, clean up your algebra first. But, as I mentioned to you guys before, and you're going to see this a lot so I can do more problems, I'm not going to make you integrate by hand a bunch of problems. A few problems I will, especially the more interesting ones. But the ones that, well, okay, I would fold this out. This would be 2x minus x squared times 2x minus x squared. That would be 2x times 2x is 4x. I would fold this thing out. Minus x squared squared is x to the fourth. And then I get a bunch of terms. I integrate each term. Then I plug in top minus plug in bottom. But I told you guys before, in Chapter 7, my focus is going to be different. I'm going to ask you a question. Set up the integral that calculates the volume. That is the answer for setting it up. And then I'm even going to tell you, use your calculator to integrate some of this stuff. Because they're not hard integrals. It's just tedious to fold all this stuff out and then come back to like like term. So here I go. Second quit. I'm going to put this on my calculator. So math number 9. And typically, when I integrate this thing on a calculator, I leave the pi off, and I'll leave pi in the answer. So I'm just focusing on the integral part. Integral from 0 to 1 of parentheses 2x minus x. Oops, wrong button there. Let's go back there. 2x minus x squared, close parentheses. And I need to put parentheses around this guy, sorry. Because you've got to square him minus parentheses x squared, close parentheses squared. I know x squared squared is to the fourth power, but you know what? Careless error kills in this class. And because careless error kills, since I've got it written like this, I'm actually going to type it into my calculator just like that, it's just to make sure I don't make some bonehead careless error on the problem. So if it looks exactly like that, the only thing that's missing is the pi. I hit enter, and what do I get? 0.333333. Three, 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 three. I think you can figure out what fraction that is. And so what's my answer? Pi over third what? Units cubed. That is the answer. And now here comes the fun part of the problem. 
fun part of the problem is this. <laughs> what did you just find the volume of? So now I'm going to take this picture over here. I'm going to show you what I found the volume of. This is my region right here. And I'm rotating it about the x-axis. So if you rotate it, you get this reverse image down here, and you're rotating it. So you've got this bowl-looking thing that's been scooped out internally. Does that make sense? You found the volume of this widget. There you go. Did I lose you guys anywhere? But notice, if I start trying to do this kind of drawing before I actually set up the integral, I'll lose where my points are at, who's on top and who's on bottom because of that rotation stuff. Use the region first, set up your integral, calculate it, and then you can go back later and tell me what you found the volume of, this idea of volume rotation. But as I was mentioning to you guys a few seconds ago, well, what if we want to rotate around the y-axis instead? Well, again, we're doing the disk washer method. And to do the disk slash washer method, so now where I'm using just the, the difference between the disk and washer method is very simply, uh, this is your washer method, and it becomes a disk if g of x equals 0. This is your washer method for rotating around the y-axis, and it becomes a disk method if g of y equals 0. So... Here we go. In terms of this problem, the washer method, volume is equal to pi times integral from, um, and I'm going to call it C to D, because I want to change the letters a little bit. And C to D should remind you these would be Y coordinates of F of Y squared minus G of Y squared DY. So again, trying to make the connection from what we did before to now, f of x was on top, g of x is on bottom, f of y is on right, and uh, g of y is on left. So it's going to be right squared minus left squared dy. So there's a pattern here. When I, right now, when I'm doing the disk washer method, if I've got a dx, I'm rotating around the x-axis. When I've got a dy, I'm going to be rotating around the y-axis. So take a look at this guy here. Sketch and find the volume created by rotating uh, the curves y equals x to the two-thirds, comma, y equals zero, x equals zero, about the y-axis. That right there tells me y-axis, and I'm using, because the only formula I gave you, is the disk washer formula. Using disk washer here, and I'm going around the y-axis, i got to do a dy problem. So, but I got the equation, y equals x to the two-thirds power. Let's go ahead and graph that. So y equals here. Clear out my old function. I have y equals x raised to the two-thirds power. Get rid of this guy. I got y equals zero. I don't need to graph that. I got x equals one. I know what that looks like. And the y-axis. I'm just going to graph this guy. Zoom six. So it looks like a uh, parabola going this way and that way, a square root graph going this way and a square root graph going that way, kind of. So here I'm going to draw it. So here it goes back out. And there's also this image over here, but look at my uh, numbers here. This is the equation, y equals x to the two-thirds power. Here is your y-axis. I've got the line y equals 0. y equals 0 is the x-axis. So here's top, here's bottom, that's great. And x equals 1. x equals 1 is a vertical line going through x is 1. So what region are we talking about rotating when you look at all three of these equations? Uh, y equals x to the 2 thirds, y equals 0, and x equals 1. We're talking about this guy over here. So this little section going this way, I didn't care about. It's just that little region there. Does that make sense? But here's the important part. We're going to take this region and we're going to rotate about the y-axis. Because we're rotating around the y-axis, i got to use this formula. Volume is equal to pi times integral of f of y squared minus g of y squared dy from c to d. i got to have y variable. Well, the only problem is this is fine. This is x equals 1. That's, that's that guy right there. That's on the right. This is on the left, but it's in terms of x. 
I got y is equal to x to the two-thirds power. So you know what I have to do to get it to be in terms of y? I need to solve for x. Solving for x, what gets rid of a two-thirds power? Raising it to the three-halves power. When I do the one side, I do the other. So this is power to a power to multiply. You end up getting x is equal to y to the three-halves power. And that's what this line, this curve is. Uh, x is equal to y to the 3 halves power. And so setting this up, remember it's right squared minus left squared. So volume is going to be equal to pi times integral of the function on the right. Here's your region. The function on the right is x equals 1. It's going to be 1 squared minus the function on the left of my region is this y raised to the 3 halves squared dy. The function on the right, remember, these in terms of rights and lefts, it's x equals equations. x equals 1 is on the right. x equals y to the uh, 3 halves is on the left. Does that make sense? One thing missing, though. What's missing? Bounds. What bounds are they? Now, you would be correct if you tell me 0 and 1, but you probably would be incorrect with the way you're looking at it. This is dy, so what y, I need to have y bounds. This is the origin. It is the point zero, zero, but we're talking about the y coordinate being zero. I need the y coordinate for this point of intersection. Where does uh, x equals one equal to y equals x to the two thirds power? Well, x is one there. One to the two thirds power is one, but it's y equals zero and y equals one. Those are the actual bounds. This zero and that one. Not the x axis, but the ones on the y axis. Does that make sense? Now, for this one, just because it's good practice, I'm going to make you integrate this one by hand. To integrate this by hand, first thing you're going to do is clean it up. Volume equals pi times integral from 0 to 1. 1 squared is 1 minus y to the 3 halves squared. A power to a power, what do you do with the powers? Multiply 3 halves times 2 is y cubed dy. Now integrate, leaving the pi out front. Integral of 1 with respect to y would be y minus integral of y cubed is going to be y to the Add 1, 4 over 4. Evaluate it from 0 to 1. According to the fundamental theorems, you plug in top minus plug in bottom. This will be pi times 1 minus 1 to the 4th over 4. Minus plug in pi. I'm plugging in 0 for y. Pi times plug in a bunch of zeros, you get zeros, which goes away. 1 to the 4th is uh, 1. 1 minus 1 fourth is 3 fourths pi Unit cubed. Does that make sense? And then the last thing, just to get a visual on this, what did you just find the volume of? What is this 3 4 pi unit cube answer? Well, again, take a different picture, but this was my region right here. And I rotated them about the y axis. So you get this reverse image over here and it's been rotated. And this is what you found the volume of. I don't know, it looks like a hockey puck that somebody's taken the middle and scooped out of it, whenever you want to look at this stuff. Does that make sense? But, you know, as engineers, you never know, this may be the, the piece that I need to put in my machinery to get my machinery working again, and I need to know the exact volume of said piece so I can go get the appropriate material and stuff like that you begin to see the wonderful engineering aspect of this stuff. Does that make sense? It's not difficult, but it has some issues. And later on, we're going to be moving around and talking about what if we're rotating around a different axis than the X or Y axis. So we got some more formulas to set you guys up with. But it's a great place to stop. Don't forget, we have today the review session at 2 o'clock to go over a homework set. So I will uh, see you guys then.